Okay, so this is a meeting for decision trees where we're going to cover the, ex the exercises from the book. Um, for this chapter, we're beginning with the conceptual ones. The first one uh, asks us to, to partition a fictitious set, a fictitious data set. So in that case, uh, what I did was, I, I used a, a data set that is not fictitious, it's simply <clears throat> uh, one that you get from Spotify. <laughs> the sort of um, annual summaries of your activity in that, that application. And in particular, for the Spotify data that I had about the songs that I listened to, uh, and some variables related to such songs, because in these data frames, each row is a song, a different song. So if I were to, to work with the energy of a song and its loudness, where energy is, uh, well, almost in like one would think that it is, so like how energetic is it? It's quite active or, or such. Uh, and loudness, uh, well, if it's loud or not, um, energy is going to be a value between zero and one and loudness uh, between minus 40 and zero because it's in decibels. So, what I was trying to predict is the popularity of a song that is some value between zero and 100. And when fitting a decision tree uh, and using Python in this first part, uh, this is a sort of uh, diagram that I get of how loud, loudness and energy uh, affect the popularity of a song. And in particular, we see that there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six regions, uh, as they ask us to, to describe. Uh, and then uh, I simply do that over here, where energy in the x-axis and loudness in the y-axis. And the coloring is up of the popularity, and those that they are more green-ish, they are more popular, uh, where yellow uh, indicates non, not popular. So in, in a sense, we can see that there, is, there has been a a kind of useful segmentation of this predictor space. Uh, for example, for regions R2, that is composed solely on popular songs, because they are all green. And similarly for R6, uh, despite the fact that most songs in this dataset are not popular, because there is a lot of yellow, in some, in some regions, uh, there is a high proportion of popular songs, like in R2. <laughs> and R6. Uh, okay, for exercise two, uh, let's see the question, let's say, in the case of the boosting algorithm, uh, if we set one of the parameters, that is the depth parameter uh, to be equal to one, then the final predictor, happens to be a, an additive model. That is, it, it is a finite sum of functions that each of them depend only in some predictor, not in a set of predictors. Uh, well, I saw a couple of proofs online, but uh, they didn't quite convince, convince me. So I hope that this one does satisfy you. So if we follow this algorithm that they described for the for the boost to, boosting model, that is this 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 set of instructions. Uh, so what happens when we consider d equals to one? That is only one split for the predictors. Then we start with a a, a zero value for our predictor, and and the residuals uh, they are the the actual uh, feature that we want to predict. Sorry, the, the actual response that we want to predict. So as we start for this loop for some arbitrary integer B capital capital B, we start for B equals to one to fit in the, the tree for the data. And uh, and in this case there uh, R is the, the response. So once we fit such data using a decision tree, we get a, 
a simple function. And because there is only one split, this function is of the form uh, some coefficient times an indicator function over this interval and some other coefficient times another indicator function. And, and of course, these coefficients, uh, we know who they are. For example, alpha one is just the, the mean of the, of the response uh, with respect to this, this region of the space. And similarly, beta one is just the mean of the response with respect to this region. And so this happens for some predictor, some J1, we don't know which exactly, uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, and so continuing with this loop, now we have to update the what will, what will be the final predictor. So we shrink the predictor in this step, this J1. And again, we also update the residuals. So now they are actually the residuals, uh, but shrink. Uh, they have featuring. Uh, now that I think about it, I mean, it's okay. And so similarly, for example, for the next loop, now be equal to two, we are going to fit a three for this data set and the receivers have been updated. So again, it produces some simple function uh, in the sense that it is this sum for some predictor J2 and some value T2 that splits the uh, feature space. So similarly, now we update the final predictor. It's simply the sum of this. Now over here, is, there is a two, uh, I made a typo. Uh, and again, we also update the residuals. Uh, but most importantly, once we finish this loop, this for loop over here, the second step, uh, in that case, we fit this data, this, predictors and these updated residuals. And again, the function is, uh, that describes such three is also a simple function because there is only one split. And in the end, uh, an important part is that the final function is a finite sum uh, of some scaling of these type of functions. These type of functions are of this form in particular. Uh, they are simple functions. And so it's easy to convert this sum that takes a, sorry, that ranges from B equal to one to B to convert it into this expression, into a sum from J equal to one to P of these functions that they only depend in one predictor in particular. So because now that we have this, well, as we saw this J sub B, they are some, some of this value because this x that j is at b, it's some predictor, we don't really know why. Even it can occur that the predictor, for example, over here is the same as this one. It can happen, so we simply need to, to combine those cases and sum them in this uh, sum so that there is only a, a dependence in this particular predictor. So, if the J beasts are the same for different indices, then we simply group them and sum them. But if they happen to, and if we happen to miss some particular predictor, for example, if every J B uh, is different, for example, uh, than, than the first predictor, then still we can define this function to be the null function. And it, it still, we could write it uh, in this form. D despite being null, it's just an, almost like an abuse of notation, but it's okay. So in, in that sense, uh, we can group these uh, elements so that the final predict the final predictive model is of this form, uh, an additive model. And in, in that sense, uh, boosting using depth one, produces an additive model. Uh, let's see. In this part, uh, now we work with the classification tree. Uh, and, and in that context, we saw that instead of working with the RSS, we consider the classification error rate 
Uh, but for example, also the Gini index and the entropy, uh, they are the alternative to RSS in the case of classification trees. So they ask us to, ah, uh, yes, to perform a plot, where is it, over here, over here, to display this value. And uh, re remember what those P hat uh, stood for, this P hat M sub K, that is the proportion of training observations in the M region that are from the gate class. So they ask us to consider the case where there are only two classes. So we have one proportion and the other one would be simply the complement with respect to one. So we're going to graph in the X axis, this proportion. And in the Y axis, we are going to graph uh, this sort of error that we have considered in the Gini index, classification error or entropy. So just as a reminder of uh, how these values are calculated, well, the classification error, this is its formula, and uh, similarly for the Gini index and the entropy. Uh, and to simulate uh, some proportions, some, some of these values that we want, uh, well, there are going to be values between zero and one, so we can use the R uniform function in order to get, for example, 1,000 values between zero and one. Those would be our, our values for P and one, and the other one, the other proportion is simply a complement. And so we simply perform these calculations respectively, uh, but uh, using R, right? So we calculate them. And now that we have <clears throat> the proportions and the errors, well, residuals each square, mm -hmm. and, then we can plot them and the uh, important graph is over here. If you can see that this proportion is in the x-axis, ranges from zero to one, and the value of these alternatives to RSS in the classification case, uh, well, they have that, for example, the classification error happens to be smaller than the other ones. And of course, in the other ones, we also, we also have a differentiability, there is there are no spikes in the curve, but the these values in red do happen to be greater than these other two lines in, in blue and green. So the entropy uh, provides greater values for the RSS alternative compared to classification error and compared to the Gini index. Uh, now, for problem number four, uh, let's see, it says, consider, <coughs> consider these two images, uh, the segmentation of the feature space, and also this representation of some particular decision tree. And um, starting from those pictures, they ask us to sketch the tree corresponding to the, par the partition or here in the left. And similarly, uh, I know, I'm having in mind that the numbers inside these boxes, these are the mean of the response uh, in such a specific rectangle in that region. So of course, one could draw it, but I, I because it's just uh, a simple exercise, I, I prefer to use the solution provided over here because it's quite nicely presented. So that would be, let's see, number four over here, this one. As we can see over here, the the biggest, well, no, the, the, the split that produces the biggest regions uh, are this, uh, is this one over here, x1 equal to one, because it produces this uh, rectangle to the right, that, that it is the biggest compared to all of them. So we can start with such a splitting of the space. So that is x1 uh, smaller than one would be our first split, as we can see right here. 
uh, and also if x1 is greater or equal to one, that is in, in this rectangle over here, then we can see the mean of the response is five. So in the, in the representation of the tree, we would have for sure the value five. Uh, and there is a similar uh, interpretation for the following nodes, the following regions, but in particular, uh, I'm only to focus in one of them because it, it may be too redundant instead. <clears throat> Let's see what happens with this case in particular, this 10 value for the mean of the response. And we can notice that, that in, the followings, in the following sense, for example, we split via x1 equal to one. Now we focus over here to the left. So in the diagram, we go to the left. Then we split, uh, again, <coughs> looking at which are the biggest rectangles, we can see that we split via x2 equal to one because it produces this big rectangle compared to the other one. So we're going, <coughs> we're going to 10, so we have to go down over here. So that would be x2 uh, smaller than one. Well, smaller or equal. So in the diagram over here to the left, we can go from here to here to here. And now uh, as we just got spoiled, the following split, now that we are in this region, is x1 equals to zero. So now we are over here. And it would take that over here. If we are to the right, x1 greater or equal to zero. And lastly, just to finish up, uh, we want to go to 10. So we need an over split. In this case, it's this x2 equals to zero, and we want, we want to go down, so it would be x2 smaller than zero. So we're here to the left, and again, we, we, we go to the expected uh, value, 10. <coughs> so that's a basic idea. And then, uh, ah, and the access to a sketch the feature space partition, given the tree. That is given this diagram over here to the right. Um, for example, over here, we're starting with x2 smaller than one. So the split that produces the biggest regions, that is the greater rectangles, it would be with respect to the line x2 equal one. Uh, and that's basically what they do, as we can see over here. With this line over here, we get two big rectangles. This one over here, and then this other one that is also pretty big. <clears throat> then it says, uh, let's see, let's go to this region over here. So it says x2 smaller than one. So now we go over here in this region. And now let's go to this region. So we follow also this condition x1 smaller than one. And that would be, given that we are over here and we want x1 as more than one, this is one. So it would be this particular rectangle with mean minus 1.8 as expected. Uh, and similarly for the other regions, uh, we, we don't have to do that for all of them. Uh, now, exercise five. <clears throat> now, this is more related to, to bagging and th those sort of scenarios when we consider many trees and one model that it is a, an aggregation of those trees, a, a sort of average. So, in this particular case, uh, we work with 10 bootstrap samples from some same data set. And in, and in this data set, uh, we only have two classes, red and green, and the classification tree uh, that it is applied. Uh, I don't know, and then for each of these bootstrap samples, we apply a classification tree. And then we fix some value X. Uh, yeah, we fix some value in the predictor space. 
And now we want to estimate what is this probability. What is the probability that the class with respect to this observation is red? Uh, so we have 10 trees because we have 10 samples. So for each of those samples, we have, sorry, for, for the, each of those trees, we, can, we have an estimate of this one. It, it is just the, the proportion in that particular region. Well, in those particular regions, sorry. So for example, in the first sample, it has its tree, so it has its segmentation of the uh, feature space. No, sorry, of the predictor space. Um, so we want to know when X belongs to a region, what is the proportion of observations in that region that has a class of red? Then for this case, for this sample, it's 0 0.1. Uh, again, it's similar for the other uh, samples. But the idea is that we get these probabilities for this. And now we have to reach some kind of consensus to what would be the aggregate result of these probabilities. And the usual case is to consider the majority vote approach. So given these probabilities, well, that we have over here as well, um, over here. Given these probabilities, uh, what would be the majority vote? Well, there are only two classes, red and green. And this says a uh, probability that the class is red is 0 0.1, probability that the class is red is 0 0.15. But then, because there are only two classes, we only need a probability to be greater than 0 0.5. So how many of those are? So how many of those uh, are votes for red? And we see that there are six of them. Uh, similarly for green, we need the probability to be smaller than 0 0.5, again, because there are only two classes. And how many of those there are? So how many votes for green? And those would be for... And from this, we can see that the code be the winner be a majority vote, well, red. And then they ask us to, to use a different approach to a, a different alternative, sorry, a different way to reach a consensus probability using these ones. And now that would be to use the mean. So what would be the average probability? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. However, we do know that for such average probability of these 10 ones over here, uh, A that happens to be a smaller, well, a smaller or equal than 0 0.5. I think in particular it's strictly smaller. So in that sense, the average probability uh, is smaller than 0 0.5. So it is more likely that uh, the class particular to that observation is green. And again, in this part comes into play what I mentioned in the other, well, in the previous meeting about the, what is called the arrows in possibility theorem. Because in these cases of classification trees where we are uh, performing some kind of bagging, so also even in random forest, uh, once you want to get to the final uh, prediction for some observations, the predictions that you had for each of the samples, they define the kind of voting process. Well, no, they define the kind of vote. So then as we saw different voting processes uh, produce different results. One Over here, one produced red as a result and another produced green. So yes, uh, another consequence of, such the, of that theorem would be that there is no perfect process for decide, for determining a, a net prediction, that is the aggregate prediction, using any finite number of samples. So it, it's really not like we can say that a oh, majority vote is better than average probability. Uh, there is not even a best method. So I don't know, they are, they are all not good enough.
And then the, the, last, the last one of the conceptual uh, exercises, they ask us to provide a detailed explanation of the algorithm for fitting a regression tree. Uh, well, I did like the, 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 the explanation that they provide. I think it's the same page. Uh, yeah, it's the same. Uh, and also this video over here. Uh, I'm going to send the link. Let me let me share it. Sorry. Solution for R uh, and this being uh, Well, the video is a little bit cringy. Uh, most of his videos are, but they still, uh, I, I, do, I do appreciate the effort. Uh, they, they do work to, to make the concepts a little bit more clear. So, okay, so this part. <coughs> Sorry. So, of course, in the book, there is an explanation of the algorithm for, the, for fitting a regression tree. So we don't have to read all of these, but only focus on these particular steps. So as we saw, we have some data, some set of predictors, some, some response that we want to determine. So we start by dividing the predictor space. We split it into different and non-overlapping regions, R1 to Rj. And for each observation in some region, the predicted value for that observation would be the mean response of the values, well, of the training observations in that region in particular. And then we denote the this y hat of R sub j. So how can we uh, partition the feature space? Uh, of course, it, they could be any shape, but the main well, one of the main advantages of using trees is the, the easy interpretability. And in that sense, uh, a quite uh, simple geometric shape to consider for these regions would be a rectangle, well, a high dimensional rectangle. So in that sense, we're going to divide the feature space into boxes, well, high dimensional boxes. And what we want to minimize is this sum again it is just the rss however what now it's changing is the the regions that we are using to split the feature space <clears throat> so there are yes yeah, there are actually infinite ways to partition the feature space into boxes so of course we cannot consider every possible every possible way of doing that. And even if we try to do a, a finite case, so like a discrete version of that problem, there is still too many ways to, to perform it. So a, a, a computationally exhaustive search for these regions would be possible at least at the moment. So in that sense, we don't really try to minimize this thing. However, we are going to perform some minimization, but one step at a time. Uh, that is what it is called recursive binary splitting. Well, in the book, they, they label it as a top-down greedy approach. And what they, what they mean is that whenever we are splitting the region, we are doing that in a way that we are always choosing the best split at a particular step. So for example, if it's some at some point, we split a region. Uh, despite the fact that there is another split that lowers the RSS, however, that it might be the case that in a following split, the total RSS is even lower than expected. So, like we uh, we have a. Uh, uh, a non minimization in one step but that it produces a minimization of RSS in a following step. 
Uh, those type of scenarios we are not going to consider. We are going to try to minimize RSS at every splitting moment that we are going to perform for the tree. So, so well, how, how would we uh, perform that splitting? Uh, so you focus only in one numeric predictor. Well, yeah, one at a time. And then you have to check for a lot of values for this particular predictor, which of the partitions, for example, you fix some T and see what happens for regions XJ greater than T. You calculate the RSS in that region. And then you can also consider the other region that is a, well, that kind of the complement. Now XJ uh, bigger or greater than, no, greater or equal to, to that value T and you calculate the RSS in that region, then you would take, sorry, you would consider the T that produces the smallest sum of those two RSS values that you have calculated. So we are splitting into two regions, each region that we encounter that has a, at least five observations. If we don't provide this stopping criterion, then well, probably in the end you only have points. No, you would have a different box for each point. So again, that would be like a total overfit. So pretty worthless in the end. So we're performing this type of sum, the RCCS in one region and then in the sort of complement. And we want to minimize that. Um, we consider also with the stop, this is stopping criterion over here. <laughs> we only stop once all regions have five observations or less. So in that sense, we can construct a very big tree from our particular data set. However, as we saw that, that tree, it would probably uh, lead us to some type of overfit. So now we have to consider a subtree so that the testing error uh, can be minimized. So in that sense, we, we perform a similar step as in the previous chapter. We add some penalty terms, some alpha non-negative, and then we consider this equation over here because it happens to be the case that if you fix any alpha non-negative, then for this large tree, that we constructed in the previous step, uh, there is going to be, there is going to exist some subtree. I think it's also unique uh, that such that such subtree allows us to minimize this particular function out of all the possible subtrees of T sub zero. So, of course, uh, we already know what would be the appropriate alpha so that this can be minimized. Uh, however, what we are going to do is to consider some different values of alpha. And of course, via this proposition over here, each of them also gives you in return some particular subtree of the initial large tree that we have constructed. So via changing these alphas, we have subtrees. And in that sense, is that we are going to find the optimal alpha that would give us a, the optimal subtree. So to, to find alpha, well, what we do is just uh, you have cross validate, careful cross validation. Uh, so we repeat these two steps. That is, we get a sample, then we construct the large tree. And then uh, we can trim that tree for using this function in particular. Um, then that you get a lot of values for alpha. We're going to pick down one that minimizes this type of error. And now again that you have your 
minimum alpha. Going back to the CRM, I think that the existence over here is actually unique existence. It probably is because uh, there are only a finite amount of subtrees of this large one. So now given this alpha that minimizes the MSE, then we, we also have the particular subtree of the initial big one that minimizes uh, the testing error. And that would be the tree that we will work with. It provides a, a good generalization for the model. Okay. Well, and that's it for the part of conceptual uh, exercises. Uh, kind of sadly, the applied exercises, they're pretty like copy paste ish. And it's mostly just simply following the instructions from the lab. And they didn't require quite a much, quite much of thinking. Uh, and I did use a couple of repositories. Uh, some using Python, some using R. So let's see. Do we have time? Okay. Uh, exercise seven. So in the laboratory, we saw that for this Boston dataset, uh, I think it's Boston housing dataset. Uh, for, well, for the functions that R provides you with, uh, well, let me check something. Um, it's, I don't know, it's okay. I have the exercise sharing in another file. Okay, no wonder I didn't find it. Okay. Uh, so for the functions that we use uh, in R for, for these uh, three algorithms, we can use these sort of parameters. Uh, that would be how many predictors would be considered in our bagging process. And also, well, how many trees are we going to use for this aggregate, well, not aggregate, sorry, for this average model that we are going to get in the end after performing a lot of a lot of samples. So well in the in the lab they perform some particular case of these parameters. So now they want us to repeat the, what they did, but changing these values. So we're going to create a plot that displays a test error when perform when when selecting random forest of the Boston housing data set. But for more values of how many predictors to use and how many trees to use also for the final average model. So I think, yeah, it's about there. Well, in Python, it's mostly the same. So we can load the Boston housing data set. Uh, let's just take a quick glance at, uh, and what is it? Well, what it is? We have this sort of variables, a crime per capita by town, proportion residential, and such and such. And what we want to predict is this one over here, this column of the median value of owner-occupied owner homes but measured in thousands of dollars. <laughs> okay, so we load the data. Uh, just in case we drop missing values, for every row. Um, we perform the splitting from train to test. And again, we want to predict this particular column. And in this case, we have a, a proportion of 10% uh, would be the testing data. So now, how many predictors do we have? Well, that would be the expression over here. And now, uh, to perform the random forest, of course, we can really consider many different values of how many predictors to use. Uh, but in particular, we are using, sorry, we are uh, working with three scenarios. In one, we use all of the predictors. So that is just a bagging case. Uh, in another case, we use 
half of the predictors for each forest that we are going to construct. No, no sorry, for, for every splitting process, for every forest that it is going to get constructed. Uh, and the other case is uh, the usual value for how many predictors to use in the case of random for of random forest. And that would be simply the square root well, rounded as an integer uh, of the number of predictors. So how many trees to consider? In this particular case, I did it uh, from one to a hundred. Um, now that we feed this random forest model to the training data and perform the particular predictions, uh, what we are going to store is as a function of the number of trees considered of the number of predictors used in each split. Uh, and what is the, the square root of the mean squared error? Once we graph it, sorry, once we plot that those specific values, we have this graph over here. The x-axis number of trees, y-axis uh, the RMSE. And as we can see, uh, as expected, uh, this line is red. That is the, the usual case for random forest. It does produce a, a smaller testing error compared to the bagging case that is using all the predictors or using half of the predictors. Now, the, the discussed in particular to, <coughs> to draw more conclusions from this data. So, for example, for each of these three scenarios, that is how many predictors to, to subset in it is at each splitting step. Uh, for all of these three cases, we see that the RMSE is decreasing. Of course, not, moni not, not monotonically, uh, but average-wise, it, it is decreasing. Uh, also, as I mentioned, uh, the smallest testing error we found was for the usual uh, number of predictors considered in random forest. Um, and the other thing is that, well, it was a mention in the book, but now we have a little bit more of confirmation that even if we consider more and more trees for the aggregate uh, model, then there is no overfitting. So it's not like this testing error goes up. No, it continues going down for for random forest and bagging. Okay, so that was exercise seven. Uh, now for exercise eight, uh, well, I, I did do it in R. I tried to do it in Python, but there seems to be a problem with when you're working with categorical variables in your, uh, in your trees. Uh, well, it's pretty weird because, uh, I don't know, like, three we're, suppo we're supposed to, to be one of the good models that you can use both numeric and categorical variables as predictors. Uh, but, I don't know, it didn't work. In, in R, it did work, so that's okay. So, well, what is exercise? Let's see, we have now the car seats data. Set. Uh, let, let's look it up. Oh, it's too much to load. Okay, well, we have this data set. Uh, in the lab, they, are, they only work with sales that is the response, uh, transforming, transforming to a qualitative response variable. Uh, but now we're, because it's, it's a number, we are going to work with it as a numeric variable. And in particular, this variable that we want to predict is that is the unit sales in thousands at each location. It is a simulated data set containing sales of child car seats at 400 different stores. Okay, we want to predict the sales. And we're going to predict that using different types of regression trees. So we, we are going to compare them also. Uh, well, we first split the data into training and test sets. So uh, in the code, 
when we load the data, uh, I have to drop one column because there are some indices that will need it to be dropped. So as you can see over here, and there are both numerical variables as categorical, like urban or yes. Well, well, they are the well, they are dummy variables. This one over here, shelf lock, but with medium and such and such. <clears throat> okay, so we we split the data so train and testing. So we can do that in the following fashion, simply some sample because it, it's not a time series, it's okay. Now they ask us to fit a simple regression tree. So we're using the functions, again, we're going to predict the sales using all of the predictors um, with respect to the training data, of course. So I will edit get this error. I am not sure if my result fit much uh, what you guys did, because it, it also was a little bit different than the solution over here. Um, but let's see. So we fit this regression tree. Uh, we can plot it and take a look at the, at the variables that are getting considered at each splitting. So in particular, price is the first variable that, that appears. So we can already get a sense that price uh, is quite important to determine uh, the response. In, the, in this case, to determine the, the sales. And um, how many regions do we have? Uh, well, instead of counting, we can use summary and we get that there are 20 regions, well, or 20 nodes. Now we can perform a prediction using this model of how many sales there are. Uh, from that prediction, the mean square error is 7.83. So now we go back to the step in exercise for racing of using cross validation to estimate some alpha. Um, it happens to be quite easy to do in R. I, I tried to do it in Python. I, don't know. I, I didn't even find the function to do it. They were all implementing their, or their own cross validation functions. And in R, it's already a given. Okay, so we use 10 samples for this cross validation. I don't know why I get so many errors. Uh, even despite this part over here, even if I did run this part of dropping an ace, I still got errors because supposedly there are no missing values in this data frame. I mean, it would be pretty weird if they are because it's a simulated data set. And but well, at least the result was as follows. So, okay, over here, uh, the result of this cross validation, well, we have different sizes that is different amount of nodes or regions, and uh, then some error related to to the regions. Uh, and this case is the alphas. I didn't quite get uh, why the alpha could be minus infinity because. In the function itself, where is it? In the function, or here it doesn't quite make sense. Why would it be minus infinity? Well, that I don't know. Uh, and once we use the results of the cross validation, and we simply plot it in the following sense, we get that. As a function of how many regions are we considering for these trees? And what is the cross validation RSS? We obtain a minimum for this particular number of regions for 17. So now that we have an idea of uh, what would be the optimal size of, how, of, of the number of regions for our sub tree to consider, uh, well, we can now. From room, the initial pre using this best, best size, that is this value 17 over here. Um, now that we use this optimal tree model and perform a prediction with it, the testing error actually goes up 
which is pretty weird that one. But I don't know. I guess it, it may be because decision trees on their own, they are not good enough. So we, we didn't get that. Even using cross validation, the testing error, well, the mean, uh, the, the MSC, it go up from 7.8 to 8.1. Okay, so that was weird. Uh, now uh, we perform again. Uh, well, I will, I will finish with this exercise because there seems to be not much time. So now we perform bugging. So we aggregate many of these decision trees. Uh, well, I do set the same seed for all of these cases. Uh, well, it's the same, the same training data, uh, because it's bugging, we're using all of the predictors, and, and we want to get we want to get a sense of which of those predictors actually impact more, or, well, or, or have a greater effect in the response. So we set the parameter importance equal to true for the random forest function, and now that we perform the, the MSC for this model, it indeed went down from seven, almost seven. To almost three. Uh, and now looking at, well, taking a look at which of the variables, well, which of the predictors, sorry, was the most important? That is, uh, which of them have this value the greatest? Uh, well, price was a one, and also shell clock, so this categorical one. And, and this, this, this particular row did match uh, the observation that we did in the beginning because. Price happens to be the most important predictor. And that, that was also uh, the predictor used in the first split, as I mentioned over here. Well, well it is a different model, but the same. Now, instead of considering all of the predictors, we can limit ourselves to some of them in order to lower the correlation between trees. Um, well, it's just a simple for loop changing how many predictors are you going to consider out of all of them. Um, we get uh, uh, for this number, uh, wait. number of predictors to use in the random forest. Um, I, it's okay. And then we plot a, the number of regions of the trees that we use because we have P number of trees. We constructed P of them. And now, how many regions uh, were there in those trees? And what was the Uh, I'm not sure why I put CB. I think it's just RSS. And, and what was the, the RSS related to that tree? And in particular, we, we get that when only having nine regions, so for that particular subtree, uh, well, that was the best scenario, the, the optimal. Uh, now, it, it, it can't be nine. I think I'm getting confused on something over here. We're only changing the number of predictors to use, to use, sorry. Uh, and we have 10 of them. I, it's okay, it's okay. So over here is not terminal nodes. Uh, it's number of predictors used. And we see that for nine, that is the, the random forest constructed that uses only nine of the predictors at, it, at each splitting step, uh, that produces the smallest uh, MSE. Over here, it's not CV, it's MSE. So how much did it change? Uh, I don't have it. I wanted to see what was a, a particular MSE, but it seems to be Let's see, 
I know it's very, very small, but I don't have the exact number. That's weird. And then they ask, they ask us to do We're almost in the end. We are over here. I, I, I remember, uh, but I don't have the exact number of this y axis, the MSA, but it probably did go lower than this previous one. Uh, and the last part of this exercise, now just to, to finish up, now they ask us to perform a bar model. And a way, and there was something important. I think it got uh, removed. I probably removed it. Uh, but there was an interesting part that we got the exact same forest, sorry, the exact same tree in this part that in the one over here. So, well, they are the same tree. So, importance is the same. The test MSE was the same. I don't know what happened. Uh, at some point, I, I must have removed it. But now to finish up, and then they ask us to use parts for this particular data set. But at least when I tried, uh, it, it didn't work because it said that it, it did not accept uh, categorical variables uh, as a predictor. And as we can see, there are some of them. Or here, chef look, it's a categorical variable. So yeah, I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, well, any comments before closing the meeting? No, thanks, Lucio. Likewise, thanks, Lucio. Okay. Yeah, let me check if there is a, already someone else signed up for the next meeting. I guess, uh, uh, I also remember we were supposed to type start and stop. Uh, once we start talking, uh, well, in the presentation and also for the end. So let's just see if there, were, there is something on sign up. Uh, next week. for vector machines. Uh, so there is no one. Uh, does anyone of, you, anyone of you want to present this chapter? I won't be able to ask when now. Um... And uh, you there? Uh, sure, I'll put my name down. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, with that, we do end here, so. Uh, thank you, everyone, and see you next week. Uh, thank Bye. you. See you. Bye. Bye.